Good. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this KFTB talk in association with the Croatian Audiovisual Centre, Zagreb Film Office, and the Production Service Network. Uh, I'm Chris Evans, the News and Locations Editor for KFTV. Uh, today, we will be expanding on some of the key issues covered in our International Production Guide, uh, with a particular focus on alternative and dubbing locations around the world. As producers have become more creative in the last few months due to territories becoming out of bounds because of COVID. Uh, first and foremost, a few, bit of house, a few bits of housekeeping. I will moderate a 30 minute discussion with our panelists before we open it up to questions from you, our live audience. Uh, if you have a question, please use the Q&A button in Zoom. My colleague, Nia Daniels, has helped me to moderate today's panel. Uh, we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. Uh, right, let me introduce you to our panelists. Uh, we have Jeanette Volterno, producer and founding partner at Catchlight Studios in the US. Uh, Jeanette was previously head of physical production at Bloom House before helping set up Catchlight. Uh, she has worked on over 85 feature films, including most re recently as producer on Songbird, which was the first film to shoot in Los Angeles during the COVID-19 lockdown. Uh, we have Tanya Ladovic, uh, head of filming in Croatia and coordinator at the Croatian Audiovisual Center. Uh, after many years in PR, Tanya joined the Croatian Audiovisual Center, where as head of filming in Croatia, her responsibilities include coordinating the incentives program and promote, promoting Croatia as an attractive filming destination. Uh, we also have Michael Moffat, uh, Managing Director of the Production Service Network. Uh, Michael co-founded the Production Service Network, a one-stop shop built to help producers determine where best to film overseas and whom to rely on for local support. Uh, we also have Jonathan Halperin, producer, managing director and founder of Hero Squared, based in Hungary. Hero Squared offers producing and production services across Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, and Jonathan recently served as co-producer on the UK Hungary film, Mrs. Harris Goes to Paris, which doubled Budapest for Paris. And finally, we have Rob Howe, line producer and co-producer. Uh, Rob is a respected line producer and co-producer has worked in the film and TV industry for 35 years. He's recently filmed in a variety of locations on film and TV projects, including Lithuania and the Ukraine on Chernobyl for HBO and Sister Pictures, Cape Town on Troy, Fall of a City for Netflix and the BBC, and is currently working on Stars, Lions Gates, Dangerous Liaisons, Origins TV series in the Czech Republic. So let's kick off with some questions. Let's start with choosing filming locations in this current tricky COVID environment. Uh, what are the key factors you have to consider and have you had to rethink where and how you shoot on your projects? Perhaps be a bit, bit more shrewd with your decision-making process. Uh, Jeanette, do you want to kick us off on that one? Sure. Hello, everyone. So um, in the past, I would look at time of year. So I was looking at weather, and then I was looking at crew availability and what productions were coming in, and then, of course, what the actual locations looked like. Um, Currently, in the last few months, um, we have been looking at how far some of the actors will travel and if they're from a particular place. So it's changing, not necessarily where we're taking the production, but how we're casting the production. So we're looking at actors who are um, from that region or have a connection to that region or are okay traveling to that region to be able to set a production up there. For example, we're working on a project right now uh, that we're setting up in Perth in Australia. And we're looking at um, casting with lead Australians and tra traveling them interstate instead of traveling them from the United States to Australia. So I would say um, it's part of the comfort level of who you're traveling and what you're looking for and what the COVID rules are. And you know, clearly we're not bringing as many people to, to places when we're traveling. So it's um, it's really then about crew availability and who's there that we can actually pull in to be able to make something because it's getting really busy out there. Yeah. Was Australia always the first choice for this particular project? It was actually. This one was the, the first choice um, for the location, uh, particularly because the financing comes down there um, and the, the story lends itself to the, um, to the look, the, to, the, to the wide open space in Western Australia. Right, and Rob, do you want to take over from there in terms of the projects you're working on and the occasions you're shooting at and how you decide? We're shooting a, a TV series for Stars Lionsgate, which is called Dangerous Liaisons. And it's the uh, story of the origins of the two central characters from the play and book and uh, uh, film. Um, we're shooting uh, in places outside of Prague. 
and the choice of Prague was made before COVID. We were here in December 2019 to set the project up um, and went through to March, uh, beginning of March 2020, and then we we suspended and went came back home. We now restarted on the basis that we are gonna, going to be able to um, uh, get the crew and cast we need by the time we get to film in about 12 weeks time, uh, eight weeks time. Um, the choice of Prague was because of the a variety of financial issues in terms of, of tax uh, credits we could gain, and uh, but also to do with the locations, which we, the, the film is set in uh, 1780 in France, uh, mm. in Paris, uh, which was not an option for us in terms of expense in the same way as filming in the UK was not an option for us in terms of expense. But Prague is a, uh, a more economical place to film there is a tax credit available here, which we can take use, make use of. Um, and we've basically come back here and we're operating under COVID protocols, um, which at the moment, because we're in prep isn't too bad. You wear masks, you have perspex screens, your offices necessarily grow because you keep them smaller, the smaller people within those offices than you would normally, you hire more crew, more um, vehicles to take you around because you have to keep two or three ma people maximum. And you just have to have in the back of your mind all the time that uh, that there are the COVID protocols have to be followed, and when they're followed, they work. That must be a particular case at the moment because I know in the Czech Republic they've struggled somewhat, haven't they, with COVID? I think the numbers have just gone above a million um, today. So it's obviously uh, you know a place you have to be careful where you shoot and how you shoot, but as you rightly say, have strong protocols in place. Is that is that the case? Yeah, that is the case, and also the where we're filming are places that are outside of Prague city centre uh, in the countryside there, um, stately homes and country houses, uh, largely they are empty completely because there's no tourism. So when we go, and there won't be when we come to film and not until the summer probably. So it will just be our crew there, uh, observing the protocols, keeping a distance, um, observing their, their groups when they're there. Um, and it gives us a fairly safe environment. I mean, I have been filming in Germany last year and we had um, we travelled around from Berlin to Dresden to Munich and then over to Liverpool and we, were, we found that bubbling ourselves and even in teams of, of 150, 200 people meant that we were safe and we were tested two or three times a week and that helped an awful lot. So you'd say the bubbling approach has been successful and it's one that production yeah. should possibly take if they can, yeah? If they can, yeah. It's, yeah. it's, it's not cheap, but you obviously no. have the, the, the um, studios paying the COVID costs over and above the production costs. So that is what helps us do what we do. And when you can stay in a bubble and you don't use two, so filming in Dresden and Munich, it was the same team we'd used in Berlin. And we stayed in one hotel in each case and we were the only ones there. And that's how we bubbled and that's how we stayed safe. And on the last day in Liverpool, we, in, in, in uh, England, we tested 238 people and every single one of them was neg negative. So it does work. Excellent. And Jonathan, you've also obviously doubled uh, for Paris as well with the project Mrs. Harris Goes to Paris in Hungary. So tell me a bit about that and how that worked in the process, obviously, filming during COVID. Well, I think they would have been here in Budapest anyway, because Budapest is a very convincing double for Paris, and we get a lot of those types of projects. Um, the, the why Budapest in the time of COVID on a broader level was you know, the National Film Institute here was very supportive and pushing out the message that Hungary was open for business. And they were doing that with very generous financial support for a number of projects that would come just to make sure the industry was restarting. And this is all on top of the already generous cash rebate that they do. So we got a significant uh, funding for Mrs. Harris Goes to Paris. And Hungary is open and with the, the support of the NFI, we could get people in and no onerous quarantines. Um, everyone goes under our testing protocol. So you can come right in and not necessarily have to quarantine, but of course we have our own protocol. That means you have, to, you have to come in and you have to be tested twice and you have to stay put in your hotel room. But the government wasn't mandating anything for foreigners that had to come in. And they still aren't, whether you're coming in from the UK or from the US or anywhere abroad, with our invitation letters, you can just come in and sort of be under our supervision on the production. So, um, you know, and, and there were actually benefits to shooting during COVID in that the streets were empty. You didn't have to close sidewalks. 
restaurants were all, you know, very willing to give you space for crew or for catering or for, for whatever, for, you know, a lot less money than it would have normally been if they were open and having to, you know, push out customers. So, so there were, there were benefits and there's a curfew here, which uh, starts at eight o'clock, but we have our work papers to let, allow us to shoot after that. So you're, you're on empty streets. That's, that's normally a filmmaker's dream to be on empty streets without people bothering you. So can you just, can you just touch on some of the great locations that you filmed at for that particular project? Because I know that you were doubling as a safe for France, but you found some great places to shoot, didn't you? Yeah. So, you know, Paris is, is good with Budapest and it was on the streets often. In Buda, there's a very convincing, you know, Montmartre with the staircases and the the rolling hills of Montmartre a little bit. And, and that's a little different than your normal sort of flat cityscape. And, and we were all over at, at the theater, which is a convincing Moulin Rouge. And that was a location we would have had a lot of trouble getting during non-COVID times because the theater is normally running every day. And in this case, it was shut down. So we had our pick of days, whereas, you know, during a regular situation, we would have had to only shoot on a, you know, one particular day and at night when there was no audience. So you, you just have to sort of take it in stride and find a way to keep making movies. And what about in Croatia, Tanya? Can you tell me a bit about the situation there and the projects filming at the moment? Well, uh, hello to everybody. In Croatia, there are um, uh, many preparations going on. Uh, there are not uh, some big uh, international projects filming right now, but there are many preparing for to start from, May, from, March, from March and then uh, in April and May. Uh, we have two uh, biggest filming seasons in Croatia that do not collide with tourist season. So, uh, usually, um, uh, filmmakers film in Croatia from March to uh, June, even July, and then from September. So we expect crews to come from, um, from March. Uh, um, things are getting better with the COVID situation. We had a peak in December, but uh, since um, uh, February 1st, uh, the government started losing the measures. So we still have uh, restrictions for uh, travelers from UK. Uh, but um, I really hope we will get the, uh, all the procedures done to have it ready uh, until the cruise starts to come into Croatia. Brilliant. And Michael, finally, um, coming to you, I know obviously you guys at the PSN have, have done a lot of projects recently, including in outer space and in the jungles and all over the, in the Arctic Circle. You seem to have filmed about everywhere around the world. So tell me a bit about some experiences of late, you know, in shooting projects in difficult environments and, and obviously in difficult times with COVID and how that's been, the obstacles you've faced. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, hello, Chris and uh, all our mates here. Uh, I, I think one of the, the sort of to start off with, if you imagine that, that uh, our biggest concern, of course, has been safety. And safety is a moving target. Um, and, and actually, I have a very interesting little um, story I could tell you of a sequence of events that happened uh, right in uh, Portugal and Spain. Uh, because in uh, the summer of 2020, uh, we had our partner in Spain filming, um, was chosen to film uh, an, an unscripted reality called Love Island for Germany. This was ITV Germany. Um, and it involved uh, three weeks filming, uh, or, and it was 300, no, excuse me, it was four weeks filming, eight weeks all together on set, 350 people with cast and crew all together, over a thousand PCR tests, no COVID cases. So happy to say that, that's possible. But that was Spain and that was summer. Fast forward to November of last year, and we had a German production company um, looking to do a feature film in the south of Spain on the mainland. Uh, but at that point, there was a peak in cases. There was a spike that we were looking at in the mainland of Spain. And so the German producers felt uncomfortable with that and they chose to pivot and move to the south of Portugal. So in a matter of a few weeks, they rewrote the script. Uh, they were in touch with our partner in Portugal. They decided to shoot in the south of Portugal. Uh, they did manage to do this pivot quite well. Uh, our team was able to turn it around in a few weeks time. Uh, in that case, it was 30 German crew, 20 Portuguese, and uh, six cast. Again, lots of testing twice a week, uh, but no COVID cases. So success yet again. But now we're in February. And where are we now? Well, the Germans for ITV are back in Spain 
They're not in Portugal this time, they're back in Spain again, and they're quite happy to go to the Canary Islands and do a winter version of Love Island. So um, one of the things that we've, we've come to realize is that uh, when, we, when we tackle safety, we look at it as a moving target and, and we're all trying to predict how things will be. But ultimately, um, if you're working long format, as many of the producers that are here um, in this talk, they have time to look forward and, and can plan ahead uh, and, and shift dates around. Uh, with commercials, it's a lot tighter turnaround and that's where they start looking even more quickly at saying, well, if it's not gonna work there, then let me take it somewhere else. And that's, that's what we've been dealing with is that uh, juggling act over these last months. And when you're all looking to sort of work on projects, uh, particularly, you know, doubling them for other locations, what are the key uh, factors you consider like cast, script, you know, is it, is it mostly COVID related? Uh, Rob, do you want to kick off on that one? I think that the, the uh, choice of the location pre-COVID was to do with, um, for instance, with Chernobyl, was, was to do with factors within Lithuania, for instance, that we could make work. This is a film-friendly country, which has um, people who could, uh, wanted us to go there and give us a certain amount of credit to, do, to be there. So, and they also had an RMBK reactor that we could film at, which uh, helped a lot. Um, and then we had to make a choice about where to find architecturally larger um, places than, than you would find it within uh, Vilnius or other cities in Lithuania. So we then went to Kiev for those and Moscow for some establishments. So the choices there were, were specifically to, we used Lithuania as a substitute for Kiev and Ukraine, which is where Chernobyl took place, Chernobyl is. Uh, and we used, we said there's a limited amount of filming in Kiev and Moscow to establish the, the, the reality of the situation. So on Munich, we were, it was meant to be set wholly in Munich and we filmed in Berlin, large, um, well, Berlin because it had, it was very film friendly and we could film in large squares in the center of town uh, which were built obviously pre-1938 and were um, a large monu monumental um, areas that could substitute for Munich. We went to Dresden for hotel, which is where the British um, ambassador and his team stayed, Chamberlain and his team stayed in Munich and we could make the interior of that work for that. And then we went to Munich itself, which was necessarily and understandably um, nervous of a film around um 1938 and Hitler, and some instances where we had to have um, swastikas, big swastika um, banners hanging. They didn't want any of that. So we filmed there for a limited amount, but we did manage to film in the, the uh, um, Führerbau building, which is was an iconic building where Hitler was based. And so we did manage. So you, you two, we chose locations there to fit specific needs, understanding that the central town of the film uh, was would not be accessible for this subject. Then we came to the UK and, and we decided we'd film in Liverpool for London in 1938 because they have stucco fronted buildings down by the dockside, Liverpool, which can front for Whitehall and um, uh, Piccadilly, specifically for areas of the scenes that are meant to take place in the Ritz and along Whitehall, because filming in those areas in London is almost impossible and very, very expensive. Although let's be honest, Liverpool is now so successful as getting people to go there that they're becoming very expensive and inaccessible as well. Yeah, true. If you go back to the previous first uh, uh, gentleman's comment. COVID made it a lot easier because the streets were empty, and we could do what we liked in many ways, which was very helpful. And Jeanette, I know you've obviously shot uh, quite a few projects that have doubled for elsewhere. I know we've talked in the past about Black Christmas, for example, which you know doubled Dunedin for the, you know for America. So. And I think you mentioned you've also doubled Liverpool for Russia. So perhaps talk to me a bit about those experiences and how you went about uh, you know, doubling them. Sure. So um, Black Christmas was a film that Universal wanted Blumhouse to uh, have out um, in, a, in a record amount of time. We shot it in June, July, and it was released in December. And um, when I was, I think we probably had about 10 weeks before we started shooting to find a location. That's how fast they greenlit the script. So um, without being able to throw a lot of money at it, we had to figure out a place where we could have uh, East Coast of the United States look like a, like a college town with snow, with frosted breath, all of that. So um, 
the most logical place for us to shoot was a place that was already going to be cold. So we chose Dunedin down in the south of New Zealand um, because of the college that they had there. And it looked very East Coast United States. And we were able to, the, I think the hardest part, the challenge there was anywhere outside of North America, it's, it's near impossible to double um, the houses with the lawns and the driveways and the walkways. Like that is the hardest thing to find anywhere in the world, but we were able to find enough pieces there and, and couple them together that we could come up with a fraternity house and a sorority house and double the front of them and make them look like they were in the United States. So that was, that was chosen because of, we didn't want the visual effects for the breath. We could add the snow and we could add a little bit of atmosphere and stuff, but to try and make it cold, you have to make it believable. And you know, you don't want to see nothing coming out of someone's mouth when it's supposed to be winter time in there. And the, the piece that I did um, in Liverpool was when I was living in London back in the day, working in visual effects. And we did a little film called Hillary and Jackie. And they needed, they didn't have the money to go anywhere. And it was shot in the UK. And so they picked Liverpool and chose a square in there. And with visual effects, we were able to put in a statue. We were able to put in some snow. We were able to put in a, a building in the background that made it look like we were in Russia. Fantastic. And Tanya, can you tell me a bit about some of the projects that are filmed in Croatia? I know that uh, Croatia has been used as a double for many, many locations in like series and films like Mafia and uh, The Hitman's Wife's Bodyguard, projects like that. So tell me a bit about some of the locations you have to offer and how they double for other places. Well, Croatia has really this advantage that we are such a small country, but so diverse and uh, we can double for almost for almost anything. For example, in McMafia, Croatia doubled for 12 different countries and territories. Uh, and um, especially our, our capital Zagreb was uh, presented as Prague, as London, as Moscow and Geneva. So four, four towns in, uh, in, in Zagreb. Um, also, um, uh, some of the, uh, for example, Rijeka doubled for Mumbai, and um, this was something I couldn't believe also when I saw it, uh, how it turned out on, uh, in the series. Um, uh, it is um, most common that uh, Croatia doubles, uh, especially this Adriatic coast part, the doubles for Italy or French Riviera. Uh, this is very, very popular. So everybody, want, because of course it is uh, much more economically um, accessible. And um, also what was interesting, for example, Dubrovnik uh, doubled for Jer Jerusalem. This is uh, some, of, some of the projects uh, that were recently done uh, end of last year. And also, for example, in, in Nightfall, uh, the, the Dubrovnik also dub doubled for Jerusalem. Um, in the, the Hitman's Wife Bodyguard, uh, Rovin doubled for Italy, but uh, for example, Zagreb was played as, as Zagreb. Uh, so <laughs> everybody in the tourist office was, was happy about it. So Croatia really, really has a, a lot to offer and especially in this time because we are such a small country and you can travel from Zagreb to Adriatic coast in an hour, hour and a half and um, it, is, um, it can be really good for the, for the productions. That's a really interesting point actually, uh, the fact that one country can double for so many different locations. Do you think productions generally are looking at places like that where they could just base themselves and double for lots of other locations? As to say previously, pre-COVID, a lot of series were filming all over the place, traveling different countries, left, right and center. Do you think that's becoming less the case now and, and productions are more focusing on one country and seeing how they can double it for others? Michael, do you want to come in there first, perhaps? Sure. Uh, I can say that uh, producers have lead feet now. Um, they really, I mean, travel is is reduced, and you think twice, three times about, you know, just jumping in a plane and heading somewhere else. Um, so I, I believe it's 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 just common sense that that we'd all be looking at getting the most out of locations. Um, and uh, you know, I'm reminded listening to Tanya, we. Uh, uh, prior to COVID, but just prior, uh, we were shooting, uh, our partner in Croatia was shooting uh, for a Netflix series, Medical Police. And in five days filming, um, they were able to uh, do scenes that were doubled for Germany, Latvia, and also Italy. Um, so it's, it's that kind of, uh, you know, optimizing of, of one location, which in that case was a decision based on cost. Um, I think now it's cost and also COVID. Um, you know, COVID is like the, the big 
new consideration on the long list of, of all those things that producers would consider in the past, um, you know, COVID's now right up there amongst the top issues and, and it's limiting travel, notably. Jonathan, do you want to come in there as well? Sure. I mean, I was going to answer your question with just a yes. <laughs> I sort of answered it perfectly. But I think it, 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 yeah, exactly. COVID is another in the many considerations. And Hungary um, has readily available testing. Uh, it, it's uh, very good technology across Europe. And for a while, I could say just for a while, we were ahead of the US in terms of uh, ability to get people tested. And, and now, of course, with the EU sort of lagging behind the US and the UK in vaccinations, I think we have a little catching up to do on vaccinations. But, but for a while, people in Los Angeles were acting like it was the apocalypse. And in Budapest, we had testing you could get back in 24 hours and testing mm -hmm. you could get back in six or eight hours if you had to use VIP service. And, and it was fantastic. So back in August or September, that was really an amazing time for us to get started making movies again and hopefully vaccinations in Europe catch up. It's interesting, it does seem to be the case that uh, productions seem to be exception to the rule in that you can get away with a lot more, you know, get around things easier in terms of getting, you know, permits, transport, um, quarantining, etc. Is that the case? Have you found that on projects that it's been relatively straightforward still to still shoot in countries? Or have you found that the logistics involved in these productions have been a lot harder, perhaps? Jeanette, maybe? I mean, I think that uh, we're like little mobile army units. And here in, in the United States, we're considered essential workers under the, the law here. So um, everybody needs an escape of entertainment and the shelves are now empty because everybody's been sitting at home watching everything. So as long as we operate in the pods, like Rob had said, and you know, we're, we're um, careful and do all the testing and stuff, I think, this is an extremely creative industry. We, where there's a will, there's a way, and all of us will figure out how to do it safely. And I think that, um, you know, this is just another one of those challenges that that was posed to our industry, and it's been actually really amazing to see the technology grow through this whole system and and how um, people have adapted to it watching things instantly come from the camera and I can see it not even being on set we produced a show that I was in Los Angeles and it was shooting in Toronto and I was able to watch what was going on um, live when it was happening and and uh, that that technology and and how that has caught up to us has made it safer for us to be able to send teams to different places but not send everybody there and still capture all of that and do it in a in a in a way that is efficient that is safe that is a, a like a lean and mean little army unit that kind of goes in and gets what it needs to do brilliant and rob i can see you got your hand up you wanted to add a further point now yeah, i think what's, there's two things really one is that last year filming munich we had one day's um uh, uh isolation while they before, when they came in they were tested and if they were clear then they could carry on and film in 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 Prague and also in other places we now have a week so if we have a cast come in that's filming for two days they come in they have to stay for a week in a hotel on their own quarantined and then get tested and if they're tested negative they can go to work if they're positive they can't which makes it very difficult for scheduling and then they go back to the UK and they have another week when they can't go out or do anything and if uh, our government brings in the sensible rule of putting people into hotels so they can't just go out and hang out, hang out at home, then they'll be quarantined in hotels close to um, the airport. So they spend a lovely week in Heston. Um, and I think that um, the other thing is also the, the elephant in the room for us Brits, which is Brexit. And we are now having to get visas um, for everybody coming in from the UK um, to come to Prague to film, which is not a big issue. Um, it's now been, it was, it, it, we basically you have to go to um, an, an embassy, uh, a, a, a Czech embassy in a different country, to, i.e. Berlin or Vienna or Bratislava, to get your visa uh, once you're here to extend beyond 90 days. And we're filming a TV series, which is a 25-week shoot plus a 12-week prep or more prep, then obviously you need that time. So Brexit uh, is something that's, that's, that's making an effect as well as COVID. Okay, great.
And, and just generally speaking, what sort of positive and negative lessons would you say we've learned so far from the, the way productions have managed in these COVID times? Uh, and how will that change, obviously, in the year ahead? Uh, Michael, do you want to kick off? Um, <clears throat> the lessons we've learned, I think, is um, more than anything, is to uh, value the, the confidence uh, and, and to encourage confidence uh, amongst uh, producers. I mean, I've, I've, I've seen a, a wide variety of producers that contact us and, and, and their success rate in, in actually executing projects, I think is so much determined on um, their, their confidence in moving forward and transmitting that confidence all the way up the chain of command, whether it be all the way to the studio or in the commercial realm through an agency into a brand. Um, you know, we see an awful lot of churn right now. We're, we get contacted by um, people, producers that are just kind of feeling things out and, and they're, they're very unsure. They're walking on eggshells. Um, and so, you know, we, the lesson we've learned is, is I think to, to be sure that we're transmitting, um, you know, clear and concise information about what can be done in each different film hub. Uh, this is one of the reasons we published that table on our website about the the live action shoot status worldwide is, and, and it's an amazing uh, tool that uh, producers have commented on. And uh, the feedback we're basically getting is that that's, that's what producers are starting with. That's, that's giving them a foundation to build on. And, uh, you know, we just feel very fortunate to have had the opportunity to, to give that information and then uh, watch how producers move things forward and, and also count on our production service companies to, to then execute with them. Uh, on the basis of, of solid information and, and experience in COVID, which is also critical. It's, we didn't just start yesterday. We've been doing it for a while and we've all got projects under our belts uh, using the remote streaming as Jeanette referred to as, as one of the things that's been a, a, a godsend of sorts. Jonathan, do you wanna add anything to that? Yeah, I think uh, lesson learned, personal responsibility goes a long way. And our, I wanna shout out to our amazing crew who, you know, on the first day, yeah, there was some yelling from the producers about keep your masks on, but um, quickly on the second day and then throughout the rest of the shoot, we're real warriors. And we sent out little texts, you know, keep the production safe by keeping yourselves safe. And people did it, you know, people respected our protocols. Um, you know, the producers didn't go out and party too much. And I think it, it you know, it was a different way to make a movie, but one in which everyone took everything very seriously and understood that all of our jobs and all of our fees were all on the line and uh, anything could have gone wrong at any given time. You know, there could have been a, a, a huge catastrophe. There never was. And for that, I'm, I'm very thankful to the crew, to the producers and everyone was just on point. You know, no one had worked in whatever, six months. And that's incredibly meaningful in people's lives. So if you, if you take that context and you say, this is what we have to do, we're all responsible for this production. Uh, that's what everybody did. And Tanya, I was gonna ask you actually, when uh, producers approach you about the possibility of filming in Croatia, what, um, what do they tend to ask you? Have the questions changed? Has their approach changed? Are their you know, thought process and production process completely changed? Well, they ask about the uh, about the uh, COVID protocol, of course, of course, uh, but uh, also about the um, responsibilities of the crew. But uh, uh, I can also say that personal responsibility in Croatia is really on a high level, and we had uh, uh, successful projects uh, done last year, and uh, I was uh, really satisfied also with the projects that were that applied to Croatian cash rebate but uh, also with the projects that uh, are not uh, um, eligible for rebates. For example, we had a filming of uh, US reality below deck uh, who finished uh, eventually two seasons uh, last year in Croatia because they created this bubble and everything went so smoothly that uh, then they decided to, they will not go to Malta. They will just finish the second season on the other location in Croatia. So that was really, really successful. And we were very proud of it because, um, I mean, they weren't part of the cash rebate, but it was something really important uh, for all the industry that everything is, I mean, that filming is really possible. 
And um, uh, we also had projects like last year, like the Carnival Row finished uh, filming in Croatia and uh, Oslo uh, finished uh, filming. So um, uh, the personal responsibility was very high and uh, our local production houses uh, took very, very good care of everybody. So um, I'm, I'm, I can really be satisfied and all, here or we can really be satisfied how things were done uh, last year and uh, how they are preparing everything for the, uh, for the uh, shooting season that will start that will start soon when you say soon do you have any idea as to when like international productions will start up again or, or lots of them uh, national national production is uh, already uh shooting so uh, but uh, for international productions we are expecting new projects uh, be beginning of march but uh, the domestic production didn't start sh uh, stop shooting so uh we also have some co-productions uh, currently filming and uh, some uh, announcements. So um, I think it, this will be uh, this will be a good year for filming in Croatia. Brilliant. And Jeanette, can you tell me a bit about working on Songbird? Because I know that was uh, you know the first project to shoot in, in LA. So tell me a bit about that during the lockdown. What was the experience like? And what did you learn from that? Yeah, it was um, it was very apocalyptic. It was. You know, Los Angeles when there's no cars around is is a very odd place to be. It does it just doesn't feel the same, right? So, we were um, the first people to get permits and to be allowed to shoot. And of course, the the white pages weren't out, and we were the first ones that were testing whether or not the protocols actually worked. And the the first three days on set, you could really see people hesitating. Do I hand this to you? Do I put it down? Do I wipe it? Do I like, how do I, how do we operate? And once you got past the first few days of the nervousness of being the first out on set, um, we were able to, we interviewed every department head and, and a lot of the other, uh, the seconds and the thirds on set. And we were able to report back to a lot of the unions and say what worked, what didn't work um, to help with figuring things out, stuff that we would have never known had we not been in the field. So we were very, um, excited to be able to do that and to, to actually get back to work and show people that it was possible. Fantastic. And, and Rob, how have your experiences been in the past sort of few months and what have you learned, would you say? Um, I think the, the basis of, uh, of, of most of the stuff is, is that provided protocols are in place and you have good uh, COVID uh, supervisors who are available at all places, not just on the set, but on the, with the construction team, uh, with the set dressers, with the other people. So the, so where you're going to film in, in two weeks' time, which is now being under the process of construction, you find that the within the first couple of weeks we were filming in the UK, that the, 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 the positive tests were coming from the from the construction and prop teams because they were coming from families. And I'm, I'm not saying they were more necessarily, necessarily worse behaved, but they got tested on the first day, two of them were positive. Then they realised they had to wear masks. And they wore masks and they did it religiously, however difficult it was. And part of the problem is, is your eyes, your glasses steam up. When you're sawing a piece of wood for construction, your glasses steam up. It's not clever. But they realised they had to um, obey the protocols. And once they'd done that, that actually became a very conscientious thing that everybody did. And it is, was quite surprising that everybody did it and did it so well. They needed people around them initially to make sure that they were told that they had to do it. But once they did, they did do it. And... It was the same in Germany and it was the same in, in the UK. And I found that quite refreshing. And so now I come to Prague where we're filming here, we're prepping here and we don't have, they've not had, the people on board have not had a project before, but they are set up properly. They are treating it seriously. And I think that's, the, the, and then that's a, 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 a good testament to our industry that everybody is taking it seriously and they are doing it and therefore they can continue working. One of the I things think, that I would add to that. Yeah, I would go on, say, go on to that. Um, we learned that, you know, it, when you set up the pods and you set up the groups and, and, and all of that, it's, it's great on paper, but then you don't think about the fact that like our costume designer, especially when we were shooting Songbird, it's, it's different now, but all of the costume houses were shut. So they had to go to actual stores and they were the ones, that team was the one that was probably the, that and, and set dressing. Uh, were the ones that were out in the public more than anybody else. And you can't protect them when they're out of the bubble, but that's what they had to do to get their job done. So you have to give 
more time, more people, more ability to be able to get their, their particular jobs done because they're not the ones that are, you know, in the, the bubble. And that also is part of the, is, is a cost thing. It costs mm. more money to film during COVID. And if you are trying to produce an independent movie, I don't know how you're going to do it. Because, you, you know, in my case, I've worked on the last three projects where I've got uh, studio backing or stars or, or Lionsgate, and they bear the COVID costs because they need content. And therefore, they write it off. And, it's, and if you don't have that, you can't pay for the extra vehicles. You can't pay for our German costume designer to go to, to London business class, stay in a, a, a proper a hotel on her own, go for fittings. And the fittings, it takes, she's in a room looking through a glass window or somebody on the other side in Cosprop is, is, is fitting our artist because she can't get, she's not, doesn't want to get too, they're not allowed to get too close. And everybody has to be tested beforehand before they go for these fittings. And all the extras have to be tested before they go for the fittings. And then they get tested again before they come on set. It's a big, big cost. It's a huge issue. And I've, I've spoken to several producers uh, and crew members over the years, sorry, in the last year or so, who've said exactly that, that, you know, the additional costs are you know, prohibitive in some cases. You know, it's in pre-production and production, uh, you've got so much to factor in, haven't you? So many additional um, issues to deal with because of COVID. So it is a massive fact, and people don't realise that. I think they they assume they can get by with doing this and that in, in the simplest form as possible. But actually, the reality is when they get on the set, oh, there's a lot to consider. Uh, and that's why a COVID supervisor, for example, is so important to oversee all these changes and and uh, protocols. So it's, it's an interesting, difficult time, isn't it? It's very well, it is, and I think the problem is also in places like Spain at the moment. Spain's having a big surge. Uh, you need to you need to go into quarantine before you can be allowed to uh, to go for fitting. So if you go there as an artist, you spend four days, five days in a hotel, then you you have one day's fitting, and then do you go back to the UK and spend mm -hmm. another five days in a quarantine, or do you stay there for two or three weeks before you're filmed? And then who pays for that? The production company. The production company has to be backed by the studio. It's it's a it's a convoluted and an ever growing and ever changing situation. Is it, is it easier um, setting up production indoors as opposed to outdoors? I mean, I was chatting to a producer who's working on a Sky show where they've based themselves in this sort of alternative studio space, but they've got literally everything set up there, and it seems to work a lot easier generally. Uh, than, than being um, you know outdoors and, and sort of people spread out all over the place. So would you say personally from your own experiences, like Jonathan, for, for example, you, I know you've shot indoors and outdoors around Hungary, which have you found easier to handle generally in terms of COVID requirements? The, the, the film we just did shot both in a studio and on location significantly. Um, you know, both have their challenges, but I think shooting in a studio is always more comfortable and you can always control everything. You know, or at least that's the illusion is that you can control everything. So you can sit in your trailer and make sure the whole stage was disinfected every night and, you know, you're doing your testing and everything's under control and there shouldn't be anything that you really didn't expect have happen. And on location, if you haven't closed off the whole thing and made it your own, a lot of things can happen. There can be construction workers working next door that sort of want to come over and look and see what's going on. And the COVID team has to go swarm them and keep them away. So you know, things happen on location, but things happen on location when you're shooting anyway. It's just one more thing to have to look out for. But I, I think shooting in a stage is more comfortable for most productions. Are uh, productions having to look at alternative studio space though as well? Sorry, Rob, you're going to come in there. Well, yeah, but if you're shooting outside, it's, guaranteed, it's, it's, it's better because you're in the fresh air and it blows away the aerosols that you breathe in and out. If you're in a studio, you have to constantly open the doors and, re, and clear the air within. And or if you're filming interiors on location, you have to every hour open the windows and give a five minute break just to get rid of the aerosols that are there from the, that may be infectious. Extending from that though, I mean, we, we did a report recently about alternative locations in terms of warehouses, um, you know, bus shelters, airports and, and the like being used by productions um, so they can base themselves there and, and take over the whole place. Is, is that something any of you guys have done or witnessed on any productions that you've been involved in? And has it proved successful? Uh, Jeanette, maybe, do you want to start with that one? 
Sure. I mean, we do it all the time coming from the indie space. Um, um, I, I've taken everything from abandoned buildings or warehouses or, um, you know, uh, old newspaper buildings that have taller ceilings, you know, anything that we can sort of get that we can use as a, as a place to put up a couple of walls or transform the inside. That's really where a production designer is like most valuable to a project to be able to figure out how to make something look like something else. You got to bring that person on early and they're the eyes to be able to set the scene for what location you want. And when, when I, go to various countries and cities and I'm looking for things. I'm always looking for um, what is large enough that uh, doesn't have a pole in the middle of it that we can put something in or what can easily be turned into something else. And um, I think the hardest part about that is it's, it's it usually comes down to the roof. And if the roof is weatherproof and or you know you can not hear the rain if there's some dampening on it, then you have a better cover set to be able to go towards something. But you know that's probably one of the bigger challenges because most of the you know easy ups that that have been put up over the years have more of like the the tin roof on it, and it doesn't help when you need a cover set. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else, Jonathan? Did you want to come in there? Have you you, know, have you shot quite a few different locations, so have you. To, to you know, just tie off the last question, on location can sometimes mean a very small, you know, English pub. Yeah. Um, I think you're I think you're in much worse situation when we, we had a location that was you know English pub and we found something incredibly tiny and it looked perfect, but it was a it was a real consideration. Do do we want to shoot here? What's the ventilation situation? There are a lot of extras in this scene and we haven't talked about it, but cutting extras down is, you know, a, a big and important part of what I'm sure everybody's doing right now and directors aren't liking it and, and creatives aren't liking it, but figuring out how to make movies with half the number of extras is like very smart filmmaking right now. So, you know, I, I guess I'll leave it there. You know, to Jonathan, to be smart about it, one of the things that occurred to me is that uh, we've seen both in, in features uh, and, and as well as in the commercial space, um, when projects coming to mind right now where creatives have uh, taken on what is existing for them in, in locations and, and worked with that, tried to just flip it around and say, okay, well, we know we can't really do that scene in the pub. Um, so maybe we should just try something different. And uh, I mean, it, it wasn't really applied to your pub, but one of the things that uh, was being bandied about early in the, uh, in the, the pandemic was, oh my gosh, go to Iceland. There are no tourists, you know? It's the time to catch all those fantastic landscapes, you know, with no tourists walking around on top of them. And, and it, was, uh, it didn't take long. Uh, over the summer last year, uh, we had a, a New York production company come to us and, and they, they, they wrote out a campaign for uh, Hewlett Packard um, that was about a cloud-based service. And half of, it was all shot remotely. The director was in New York um, and our team executed it uh, entirely on location. Half of the film was drone shots. The other half were with these actors, but it, the, these drone shots were just massive, beautiful landscapes that you just know wouldn't have been possible uh, to shoot in the short amount of time that they did uh, in, in, in normal times. Uh, they probably would have taken double the number of days just because they would have had to look for those windows of opportunity when there were no tourists. So it, it's a matter that, and we talked about earlier in this conversation about empty streets. Uh, there are advantages uh, in these times. And uh, I mean, you know, not that anybody wants to prolong the situation, but anybody who's got a project that really fits to that really should jump on it and get it out there. Brilliant. I'm conscious of the time and that we need to get to questions from the audience. So I'm just going to ask you a couple from people sending them in. So in fact, there are two people who sent the same question or similar. Are there any uh, locations in the UK that can easily double for Russia, in particular St. Petersburg? Has anyone shot London for, for Russia? And uh, can they give some tips and advice? I think Jeanette, you mentioned before, didn't you, about shooting? Yeah, but that was Liverpool. I mean, I would let, you know, one of the things we haven't really touched about uh, too much is how visual effects can really help on some of these things where if you've got just the lower end, the lower 
part of the street, then you can do the visual effects on the upper part of the street or in the background of it. So I would be looking, I would have your scouts looking at, you know, where your people are actually walking or acting in the scene and seeing what your production designer can put together so that your visual effects team can create from there, because that's really the magic of how a lot of these locations that we go to around the world become someplace else and they transform into that is with the help of the, the post side. So true. And I mean, was that the question was about replicating uh, uh, Russia? Is that right, Chris? Yeah, replicating Russia I mean, in, the, in uh, London in particular, or UK generally. In London. Okay, well, that, yeah. Or, 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 the, or the UK as well. I mean, there's actually another yeah. one sent from the UK, so. Yeah, not so sure about that one, although I'm sure that we could send scouts out and, and find something like Jeanette said. Um, I was just thinking more broadly speaking about countries, and I would just go to the Baltics, uh, you know, and, and partners in Lithuania, Latvia, those kind of places. Um, uh, where you can you can get bits and pieces um, that help fill it in. There's another good question here from Lindsay Dyson, who says, um, when you have to switch locations at possibly short notice, is it helpful to use a local fixer? Rob? Um, yeah, invariably it is, I think, um, if you do have to change at short notice because somebody has local knowledge, local connections, and the ability to, but it depends where you are. If you're, if you're in the UK, then you have, there will be people all across the UK that work in the film industry and TV industry that will know what to do. But if you're in a foreign country, um, somewhere like Lithuania, which doesn't have a huge film industry, if you go outside of Vilnius, you need people, you won't, you won't be able to get a local fixer to do it. But yes, in the UK and in Germany and places like that, then you should, you definitely use local fixers. Uh, Jonathan, did you want to come in and add anything to that? Well, the, the infrastructure here is so massive that I think it's equivalent to London in terms of number of crews and ability to find good people to work with. I, I don't think you would, in, in fact, if the project was of any significance, you would probably want someone to set up your SPV and do the rebate for you. And that's, that's not just a local fixer. That's a, you know, that's a proper company to do everything, all the administration. But this is it to work outside of, of, outside of Budapest, if you went, to somewhere in the small in the small of the country would there be people there to do it yeah well, depends how much money you want to spend <laughs> you want yeah. that rebate back uh okay and got some more questions coming in i've got another one here from usman gafur who says several filmmakers in india and abroad have devised what they call the bio bubble i think you touched on this rob earlier method to shoot safely amid the pandemic how effective in your view is this method Rob, did you want to sort of yeah, start I mean, it's effective, it earlier? If you're going to, if you, it was effective if you, during this pandemic, if you're going to a hotel in Dresden and you are the only people in that hotel and they give you rooms to eat in in the evening and you only mix with your crew, it is fantastically effective, provided all your crew have passed negative. Um, you then go to, yes, it works uh, and, it, and it is good. But what, what happens then is you go to Munich and you have, you lose some of your crew that are traveling with you and you have local crew, but you go to Liverpool. Liverpool at the time, a lot of the Germans were very worried about going there because of, uh, it was it was not, it was just about to go to tier three, but then they introduced testing, local testing, which proved very successful and the, the uh, infection rate dropped considerably. But again, we were staying, all of us, in one hotel that was closed otherwise. So they were very pleased to see us and we kept ourselves very bubbled and that did work. It works very well. Jeanette, do you want to sort of add to that? Yeah, I mean, the uh, the back to work protocols and the white pages and that, <clears throat> the pieces that the unions have done along with other governments and countries, those protocols are working. And it's really a matter of, um, I think it was Jonathan that said like, you know, you've got to Im implore to your crew members to be a partner with you in those because you can write the best rules ever but if nobody is following the rules or one person decides not to or they go out on the weekend you know every friday there's a memo that's sent out on our production saying remember you're part of this film family too like be careful what you're doing on the weekends because it's not just those rules the rules are great but you have to follow follow the rules right so yes they work when you follow them we've you know successfully done four films last year during the the lockdown period and we haven't had any tests that uh, were positive during the production of the of the films so 
they absolutely do work, but it really becomes the responsibility of everybody that's involved to actually maintain them. Fantastic. Uh, there's another question that's come through here from Vanessa Fraser, where she says, uh, outside COVID, since the huge rise in demand for content production, especially with the SVODs, have you found yourselves being more creative to find more unusual and lesser known locations, and maybe therefore cheaper ones? Uh, Jonathan, do you want to come in there? We're always scouting for great locations that, that haven't been seen. I mean, there, there are so many great locations here. I do worry about things becoming overexposed at some point. I watch a lot of movies and TV and I'm starting to see the same, you know, there's that location and there's that ceiling. So, but I like traveling around and exploring new places and trying to find new places. And we talk about, you know, can we find it? There's a place that's affectionately called Express House here. And it's just, you know, it's uh, the Adria Pelota, which used to be the, the sort of naval headquarters back when Hungary had a Navy. And, uh, and it's an amazing space. And you can go in and kind of do anything because it, you can build inside of it. Um, but now they're turning it into a beautiful hotel. So we have to go find a new express house where you can you know, have your playground. So we're, we're, we're constantly looking for these things and, and finding them. But yeah, I think you have to be creative from a, not wanting things to be overexposed and for wanting to give producing partners more options is not everybody's vision is the same vision. And a lot of production designers don't wanna to be told, just go here to the same place that everybody goes. They, you know, they, they want a new playground to play. So. Tanya, there must be quite a few different sort of places to choose from in Croatia. Are, are sort of locations being taken over there? I mean, a lot of producers sort of coming in and shooting at the same locations or? There are locations that are uh, really popular, like Dubrovnik or Zagreb, but uh, Croatia offers 25% cash rebate and additional 5% for locations, for filming in locations that are in regions uh, that are below average development. And uh, producers uh, uh, are using that and uh, they are really discovering great new locations and this extra 5% is a stimulation for them, of course. And uh, I can give you the example we had um, uh, end of uh, 2019, beginning of 2020, uh, filming of Tribes of Europa that will now premiere. And uh, uh, they filmed in uh, these areas, uh, mo I think uh, more, than, more than 30 days. And uh, they were filming on location called Petrova Gora, which has a monument of, um, from the communist era. So it is quite interesting and it is really uh, visually like capturing. It's also on the, um, uh, on, on the uh, art of the official art of the, uh, of the series. So uh, producers are using, using it and we are uh, really encouraging them to, to do so also. There, there are there are certainly benefits to thinking out of the box. I mean, you know, I thinking on a on your, your a guys filmed in the Arctic Circle, didn't they? <laughs> well, <laughs> they they weren't looking to to but they actually went. <laughs> they weren't looking for an alternative. They would not accept anything less, uh, and they did go uh, for that was a, a Oreo campaign. Um, and and boy, they just skated in right uh, before uh, there was uh, a lockdown in Norway, um, and uh, that was very much. Uh, uh, we were all in pins and needles on that particular project, but we managed. Uh, again, it was always a matter of you know good information carrying through in the project. But um, the the one thing that comes to mind is when we were uh, uh, shooting with uh, the flight attendant, this HBO Max series uh, produced by Warner. Uh, we we had a team. They were doing a week's shoot in Thailand, and the script called for um, just a few select scenes in Korea. Uh, initially, there was discussion about whether or not they would want to to go to Korea to shoot. But in truth, it was one shoot day. And so uh, in discussions with our team in Thailand uh, and the production designer, uh, you know, very much was, was critical in this discussion. You know, there was kind of a general consensus that, guys, look, what we need to do in Korea, we can do this here in Thailand. It's not that hard. You know, they're pretty simple scenes. We're going to have an immense amount of savings. Um, and so it was just about everybody coming around the, the campfire and saying, you know, let's think about this a little bit differently than saying we have to go to Korea. Um, and so it worked out and it was tremendous cost savings and, and also just timing. Uh, you know, it would have taken a lot of time also for them to all move up the whole troop to, to Korea. I'm trying to squeeze in a couple more questions that are coming through thick and fast. So uh, there's 
how did COVID impact the trust and confidence of filmmakers? This is from Balint Novak to start production and risk jumping into a rapidly changing situation. Do you have a problem convincing filmmakers to trust the location, infrastructure, and health measures? Rob, do you want to come in? Uh, um, um, I think last year was uh, we started prepping in July for Munich. Um, the majority of the crew came from Berlin and Germany, and therefore it wasn't such an issue for them because Germany was relatively uninfected um, at that point. It rose while we were we were there. No, I didn't find an issue. People wanted to work, provided they believed the protocols were in place and that they were producing the correct results. Because we were we were testing people twice a week, and nobody had been tested before outside of our industry. Really, when you're at home with your pet, with your, with your family, you don't get tested. Um, certainly not in the UK and in Germany. But when you're with us, you get tested. You know twice a week that you are not infected and actually that 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 in, improves the confidence in people to come to work. Jonathan, did you want to add there? Filmmakers want to believe and filmmakers want to be doing the projects. Uh, it's convincing studios that you're, you know, that you have a good set of protocols and that you're doing everything the right way. Um, you can do that by having really great health partners. We have a fantastic doctor here who's very, you know, studio presentable, who can get on calls and, and talk them through everything and make them feel safe. It's about making people feel safe, making studios feel like their money is going to be, you know, well attended to and that there isn't going to be a catastrophe in the middle of things. But filmmakers want to shoot and keep shooting. So I hope we can all keep shooting. Sort of extending from that, do you think um, with filmmakers being more creative, perhaps, will VFX be more important uh, going forward? Yeah, I believe the, the, there's been so much discussion uh, um, about uh, technology moving things forward. And one of those has been the, the virtual production uh, aspect and, and the uh, increased looking toward using the lead uh, video, the wall volume uh, with Unreal Engine. Uh, as a uh, an alternative, it's it's not something I hope that that really substitutes location filming. But in an, in an era in which we are uh, under the limitations that we are under, and also in an era in which there's so much growth in the industry, it seems to me that that virtual production is like one more tool in the box that uh, that you know filmmakers can turn to for a suitable project to to carry it out, or at least parts of it. Jeanette, did you want to add to that? Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, I, I would um, I would definitely qualify it as another tool in the toolbox. It's it will. I don't think it'll replace what uh, what we can get when you're on location because there's there's certain things that have limitations when you're shooting on a digital stage and you and you can't interact with the background. And uh, I think what creatives have done for the past year is really turn projects into, okay, this one's gonna get shelved until we come out of COVID and, and we're uh, more able to open things up because we want the, the background, we want to interact with the location, we want to have yada, yada, yada for it. Um, and then the ones that they're putting forward now that are more COVID safe, that are you know less moves to different places that have you know more of a, a core uh, group of people and less of all of the um, extras that come with it. And so that I think will shift as borders start to open and as vaccines roll out, um, the, the type of projects that we're making, that we're seeing, that we're bidding on, that we're chasing for different places will um, evolve as things start to pull, to, to open back up, you know. That was going to be my final question, actually, uh, in terms of vaccinations, uh, you know, what impacts that having so far on, on the, you know, the projects you've worked on and in Croatia, obviously, as well. Tanya, if you want to touch on that uh, and where you see things going in the next in few months or so. Well, I really hope that uh, uh, this problem with vaccines, so with number of vaccines that are available in Europe will, uh, will soon uh, get better. And uh, the vaccination in Croatia has started. Um, but uh, now for uh, older people and for uh, chronic patients. And we expect uh, in, uh, I think, a uh, month or so that it will start to the general public. Fantastic. Rob, vaccinations, um, are they? I think the uh, amazing thing is that we've vaccinated over 10 million people in our country at the moment. Finally got something done properly for, the, for um, this awful <laughs> 
Um, yes, I think that uh, the moment we've got it, we're a, we're a prior country because we've got so many people who are infected and we are being banned from traveling or may go to country con quarantine to so many places you want to go to. And because so many casts are based in the UK, that makes it difficult to film or get filming done. I think once the vaccination starts to roll out properly, there will be vaccination passports that will be demanded by countries like Germany and the Czech Republic um, from and anywhere in the world. And if you want to travel as a British person, you will have a vaccination passport. And the way it looks at the moment, we'll have that passport before any other countries, which is a very positive thing. Cheers. Jonathan? Well, oh, sorry, Michael, go on. No, I was just going to add that maybe the one country it might feature to it is Israel. They're moving awfully quick. And, um, and I would say for commercial producers, that's one place they should be looking. I mean, if Israel's already at some 50% or something like this of vaccination, I mean, I don't know if, what their projection is, but I mean, imagine that in the month or two's time, you could have a, a, a warm Mediterranean country to go to that's 100% vaccinated. That, that's a game changer. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very good point. Jonathan, did you want to add to that? Well, I think it'll be interesting to see what studio vaccination policies are. I know independent producers are thrilled to, to think that, you know, the, the main cast is going to be vaccinated and that insulates them from having to stop production and lose a lot of money. Um, but, but studios have very strict policies. And if, if they don't believe that, that the vaccinations are stopping the spread, then this is not going to end. So it's not just vaccinations, but it's, it's really seeing the impact of it all. Mm. I, think, I think we're probably ha gonna have to live with a whole other full year of this. And yeah. How do you think? I, I hope not more, but it, it almost feels like this is now open the floodgates of safety and wanting things to, maybe people are gonna be wearing masks for the next two or three years. I hope not, but it feels, so. it feels that way right now. I would also you know, I want to say something. Yeah. Yeah. That um, one of the biggest things that that we've seen uh, come through this is that we as producers have to be more of a um, an empathetic uh, uh, parent to the crew because the mental stress that all of this has put on the crew and the cast and everybody is huge from having their families at home and you know their their elders who they can't see and who are sick and all of that stuff the the stress and the mental uh fatigue that this has caused has been something that comes into the set that is a whole other level like we we talk, talked you know off uh screen before this started a little bit about um you know, intimacy coordinators, but I feel like we're at a at a level where there's almost going to be a, a mental health coordinator that's coming in yeah. to help with all of this because it's just so big. No, I completely agree. Um, brilliant. Well, listen, thank you so much, guys. That's been really interesting. Thank you so much uh, to all the speakers and to the sponsors and, of course, to you guys at home watching. Uh, thank you so much. It's been really interesting and informative. Thank you.